So I'm the director of the Centre for Applied Autism Research at the University of Bath, and with my colleagues there, Elsa, Chris, and Katie. Um, and we were opened by Dane Uta Frith last year, who some of you may know. Um, and just to have a little plug, some of the things we do for free are if you have a, if you know a young person who's thinking of going to university, um, then we have an autism summer school for young people on the spectrum who are thinking of transitioning to university. And if we have our students or recent graduates who are looking to for employment, we also have an employment school there. So just to plug that, if you know anyone who'd like to apply, there are the websites. So the slides are all um, in your pack, so there's some websites that come up. You don't need to write them down because uh, they are all there. Okay, but I'm not going to be talking about those programmes today. Today I'm talking about digital autism, really to highlight that when we talk about technology and autism, we're talking digital technologies today. And what I'd like to talk about really is, um, well, why are we talking about technology and autism? Um, what's the point of this topic? Is it the sense that we're talking about um, intervention and we're trying to intervene and use digital technologies to intervene with autistic people and try and uh, adjust them so that they can better integrate with the people who aren't autistic? Or do we have an agenda based more around uh, inclusion and we're developing digital technologies so that autistic people can be included? So there's a subtle distinction, maybe two sides of the same coin between uh, intervention and inclusion um, that I'd like to talk about today uh, and give some examples from uh, robots, social media, uh, some projects that we're working on uh, at the end there, digital social stories about finding the right technologies and also um, what we might mean by when we're looking for evidence for all of these things. But firstly, I want to look at uh, what does it mean to be digital and, and in, in this sense, because we're talking about autism and the use of digital technology, but what's the context of that um, in terms of uh, how people are using technology? So this sense of inclusion or integration has been reflected upon in the journal Autism, which is the NAS journal, uh, and there was a, a piece earlier on in the year that um, really reflected upon actually the illusion of inclusion and how uh, integration has dominated over inclusion. And, and the distinction is made in the bottom lines here where um, uh, th this is within the context of education, and many children on the uh, spectrum uh, are in mainstream schools, but if you're in a mainstream school sitting on a desk outside in the corridor by yourself, you might meet some index of integration, but you're not particularly well included within that classroom. Or if you have a, a TA sitting with you, and the only person you speak to in the classroom is that TA, then you're integrated into the classroom, but potentially not included in the classroom. So they're using the distinction between integration uh, or intervention and inclusion. Um, so what I'd like to discuss really is that distinction. Inclusion demands that we change the existing education environment in order to respond to the diverse needs. So the inclusion element is the rest of the world changing, whereas the integration is trying to change the inter uh, or intervene with the individual. So that's the kind of distinction that I'm going to be uh, alluding to throughout the talk. So in terms of the digital context, a recent survey uh, in America, but where America leads, we all tend to follow in terms of integration. A survey of teenagers was shown that 95% um, have a smartphone now. So the vast majority of young people are having smartphones. Um, and people have used terms such as digital immigrants versus digital natives. So uh, the digital natives are people probably born this millennium, really, have just been born into a world of uh, technology, and it's almost a kind of a second nature. Whereas older people like me are more digital immigrants, where we're having to learn this new digital world. So this kind of distinction <coughs> between uh, a fundamental change in younger people. Um, and the survey kind of looked at, well, what, what are these young people doing on, uh, with their digital technologies? Uh, and it's kind of the, the big things that they're doing, really, as you can imagine, probably looking at YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. They're the biggies that are being used. Um, but importantly, almost half of the young people are saying that they're constantly, almost constantly online. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with this. Uh, always having the phone on the hand and always referring to it, no matter what you're doing. And another group are kind of using it pretty much uh, at least several times a day, if not more. So the vast majority of young people aren't just doing this once or twice. They're engaging in kind of social media type activities, half of them pretty much, almost constantly online. So that's the digital context within which we're looking at uh, digital autism. Anyway, um, so you think, well, presumably they're doing this because they think it's a great asset. And you think, do you think this is positive or negative? And the same survey was showing, well, for a third of people, they think it's kind of positive. Uh, but half of people think, well, it's neither positive or negative, really. Um, but there's also around a quarter of people who think, actually, this is quite a negative experience that I'm uh, engaging in most of the time. 
So there's positives and negatives with the dominance of technology within our lives, all of which I'm sure you're kind of familiar with at some level. But this isn't just the kids. Um, they kind of, as I'm sure you're all aware, divide up different names depending which kind of technological generation you're in. And there's the millennials who are kind of born between 81 and 96. There's Generation X, if you're kind of born between 65, and the boomers. Uh, who were born after the Second World War. Um, but you can see here that pretty much the, the results for the uh, teenagers extend to adults as well. So the vast majority of people own smartphones, they're using tablets and social media. Maybe not those before, born before the end of the Second World War, so what they call the silence generation. But maybe for everyone born after 1945, uh, we have heavy internet use um, based around social media. Okay, so as you show, like majority of Americans are now using YouTube and Facebook. This is what most people are doing, and they're doing it um, for at least a couple of hours a day. So there's this new technology, and this is kind of global statistics now. Uh, so not just America, the same stats are found across Europe and beyond. And if you take a global average, people are pretty much using social media for over two hours a day uh, on average. Obviously, some people are a lot more than that, so you have variability within that. So there's this behaviour that people are doing for hours on end every single day, and that's the digital context within which uh, we are considering uh, digital, digital autism. And the sense of inclusion as opposed to intervention within a digital world. So there's a sense that this digital environment might be beneficial for autistic people. In that um, autistic people, it's argued, have challenges with social processing, that's kind of uh, diagnostic in terms of autism, but there are also relative strengths uh, that can be conceptualised as uh, repetitive behaviours or having a strong focus or special interests or uh, being able to attend things for a long time or having a strength in attention to detail or thinking systematically or logically. And these culminations of strengths associated with autism um, are argued to represent strengths in thinking about uh, the non-social world or the physical world, which includes technologies. So it's argued that maybe um, interventions, it's argued, might be particularly amenable for autistic people because they're engaging with technologies and maybe there's some kind of digital affinity between autistic people and technology. However, as I've kind of just alluded to, uh, maybe autistic people might benefit from technology, but it's in the technology, within the environment where people are using digital technologies all the time, whether they're autistic or not. So we're all kind of benefiting from uh, technologies and suffering on occasion too. Um, but maybe uh, is there something special about the, the sense of being autistic that might be particularly beneficial uh, for autistic people? So some research through past decades um, has kind of, if you look through, identified um, the aspects of uh, assessments used to assess autistic people. For example, uh, the sally Ann task, uh, and if you can see, that's a kind of representation of it. You might be familiar with it, um, where Sally has a marble and she puts it in her basket, and while she's gone, Anne moves it into the box, so when she comes back, where will she look for the marble? Kind of classic Sally Ann task, and typically autistic children underperform on this task. However, what Swetland was showing was that if you embed this within technology, uh, autistic children can learn this task very quickly. So the, this kind of technology-mediated version, you don't get the same difference uh, between autistic and non-autistic children uh, in theory of mind type abilities. Also, the Wisconsin card sorting task is used to assess executive functioning and our capacities for flexible thought and planning. Um, and with a task like this, uh, you're given a card like that and you have to think of a rule to match it to one of these. So if you're matching by colour, you might put it here. If you're matching by number, and you think, well, there's two elements there, I'll match it there. Uh, or if you're matching by shape, then you might put it on this one here. So you've got a choice to think, how am I going to match that? And you, try, you have trial and error, and the experimenter says, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, and then say, oh, you're right. And you kind of work out what that rule is, and then unbeknown to you, the experimenter changes the rule. So you then have to reconceptualize what the rule might be. And uh, this is where the sense of autistic people perseverating comes in, in that uh, autistic people can keep going with the old rule for much, much longer. However, what Ozanov showed years ago was that does happen if you do this with a human experimenter, but if you do a computer-based version, again, the differences disappear between autistic and non-autistic people. Um, similarly, we've done, uh, similarly, rather, we've done some research on emotion recognition, um, and again, we've shown that uh, you do get uh, deficits in autistic people recognising human emotions, but if you're looking at cartoons or not such human representations, then uh, differences disappear. So by digitally mediating 
uh, the tasks which uh, autistic people typically underperform on, you remove these differences to suggest, okay, maybe there is something around the digital world where uh, the, the difficulties that people with autism or autistic people can face uh, don't manifest when uh, being assessed digitally. So there's some potential benefits then of using uh, digital technology for autistic people and the NAS's website says, yeah, of course there are some, and there's some guidance for parents here saying you can learn new skills, you can be motivated. You can see it's not a huge array of benefits here, but there's kind of motivational benefits um, potentially. Um, and maybe they can facilitate making your own choices and those kind of things. Um, but um, there is, we always kind of alluded to as well, a potential flip side, and there is also some limitations associated with that. And all this is on the, the website of the NAS, um, in that this tends not to generalise. So if a, a child, uh, a, an autistic child, learns a capability within one scenario, it tends not to generalise to other situations. So if you were doing the classic kind of psychological test where you were learning um, from photos of uh, emotions and you were trying to recognise those emotions and saying that's a happy emotion, that's a sad emotion, even if your uh, performance improves upon that computer-based task, it then seems to not generalise to the real world. So that generalisation seems to be a real issue. So there are very great limitations um, to using technology. So potentially strengths and potentially weaknesses. So Missouri did a study looking at uh, autistic adults and saying, well, what do you do? Uh, what do you use technology for? Um, and you can see here that on average, autistic adults were using social networks for three hours a day. Okay, five days a week. So this was interesting. It's not immediately obvious if, if you are being characterised as having a deficit in social communication and interaction. Would you be using social media? It's not an obvious uh, yes, just like everyone else, we would be social, using social media if you have uh, a diagnosis of a social communication uh, and interaction disorder. But this study suggested actually autistic adults are using uh, social media as much, if not more, than non-autistic adults. And, and they're using it with a vast array of friends in an online context. So we found this um, saying, okay, what, what, what are you doing in this social media? And you can see it's social connection, keeping in touch. It's socially mediated activity being used in an online environment. So again, this is what other people are doing, but this is also what autistic people are doing. And this wasn't immediately obvious given the, the social deficits within the, the kind of face-to-face -face environment. But within this online digital environment, this is what autistic adults are reporting they're doing. They're engaging in social interaction. So we looked at um, Facebook and groups and communities um, to see uh, kind of what was going on. Um, and we clearly had uh, ethical, appropriate ethical considerations to look at how autistic people were uh, talking to each other in these kind of Facebook type communities. And we took an autistic group and a non-autistic group and it was difficult to work out, well, how, how might you match the different groups? So we matched them on the number of activities and it was a group um, of people who'd experienced cancer were, uh, was well matched in terms of the kinds of people were in the group. And we looked at their active memberships and what they were posting and looked at the last 100 posts um, and you couldn't tell uh, the difference between them. About half of both groups were con containing emotionally laden words and were comparably empathic, appropriately empathic. Um, I know what that's like, you might like to try this. So within both groups, unless cancer or autism were specifically mentioned, the judges couldn't tell whether the online uh, communications were between autistic people or non-autistic people in this online environment. So um, as I'm sure you're aware, many theories or, uh, of autism suggest their emotion processing deficit, deficits or deficits in empathy, but in this in online environment, they're not to be found. Uh, so we looked at well, what kind of emotions were being expressed uh, and overwhelmingly uh, they were positive and there are different emotions, sadness, angry. But I think again, between the two groups, you can see the similarity really is the overarching feature. How similar the autistic group is to uh, the non-autistic groups. And we did this with a range of groups uh, and we keep getting the same findings. Okay, so we then asked a question... Um, well, has autism impacted on your freedom to talk online? It seems like in an online environment, uh, a lot of empathic social interaction is occurring. So uh, if people were self-identified as uh, being autistic, then could they respond to our survey? And what uh, the autistic people told us was 
Uh, the vast majority of them said, yes, actually, we do find it much more easier to communicate digitally than uh, non-digitally face-to-face. And then the second one was the, the real advantages of being able to interact with other people who are like me, because uh, this doesn't, uh, I don't tend to go out or meet socially, so I can socialise online with people who are also autistic. Um, some people found it the same, and I think one person thought actually interacting online was harder. And there's a little other group like, good question, so I didn't quite answer uh, the question. But overarchingly, people did find digital communication easier. And they gave us quotes like, um, although I've learned to talk to people face to face, it's still 10 times easier online. I, I can normally talk on Facebook, but don't face to face. Yes, it's easier for me to socialise online. Um, so why might that be? When talking online, I feel so much more at ease. There's a lot less pressure to understand those kind of social cues. Uh, they're not there in that online environment. It's talk about, I don't have to read any gestures. Uh, if there are gestures, like smileys, they're all quite explicit. So there's not those subtle social cues that have to also be interpreted that often accompany face-to-face -face, uh, communication. Timing was a big feature as well. In the online, it's better for the same reason why I don't use a telephone. I need time to think through. So online communication, I have time to think through my response. Uh, and I'm given the freedom to do that. Whereas the social world, obviously, typically is very rapid. The online social world, you're given that flexibility of time to think about things. Freedom to take the time I need to respond. I can read better than I listen, so I misunderstand less because of the timing issue. And there's a but, and of course there's always a but, and it's that generalisation before. It's much easier for me to talk online, email, text, or whatever. I get too comfortable with it, and it makes it harder for me to do it face-to-face. -face. So there might be a cost to this online environment. Uh, it's better to talk online, but the internet doesn't help in learning how to deal with people face-to-face. -face. Okay, so st I'm still feeling a sense of loneliness through doing this. And it's easier to socialise online, though I still have a lot of trouble in everyday life. So there's no, there doesn't seem to be any generalisation from this online digital social experience through to face-to-face uh, -face social experience. Uh, a very recent study by Ward looked at 106 autistic adults, uh, found that half of them were using, using Facebook, about 20% were using Twitter, and those people using Facebook uh, reported greater happiness than people who weren't using Facebook. So again, it suggests that this kind of online social interaction is found to be rewarding, at least um, in this uh, environment. And this, this finding didn't extend to Twitter, and they were arguing, well, Twitter can often be not so much the social, but can be a lot of information sharing type of activities. Um, so they didn't get this effect for Twitter, but through a social media platform like Facebook, they did find uh, that it was associated with a sense of feeling happier in life. So there's been a lot of research for a decade now about autistic culture online. And these are some quotes from autistic people um, that Davidson's pulled together um, in her paper just to kind of reflect upon this online digital world does seem to be appealing to a lot of people. Maybe not everybody who has autistic, but some autistic people. So of those autistics on the internet who discuss its use, we all agree it's an amazing tool. We've already got our own country. It's a cyber country called the internet, and it's perfect. The internet provides at least some of those on the spectrum with a means to develop and maintain social relationships. The internet has begun to challenge stereotypes surrounding the competence of people with autism to communicate effectively, and the use of the internet by individuals with autism as related to conditions as part of a movement of self-advocacy. So there's a whole range of issues in there, and the penultimate one is, is, is as I'm kind of saying, it's um, almost as if I don't feel autistic online. It's only face-to-face -face I'm having the characteristic difficulties with autism, but I don't have those in an online environment. And the last point really is, is how technology has uh, enabled the, the spread of the neurodiversity uh, movement and given a voice to a lot of autistic people and beyond about uh, accepting autism as a difference. Uh, rather than a disability. So there's a lot of uh, really interesting uh, comments coming from the autism community themselves about the benefits of uh, this digital uh, environment within, within which uh, we can now socially interact. So it's not all positive, of course. There are also risks associated with the internet. Um, we're always seeing headlines around, uh, maybe relating to compulsive use or cyberbullying or addiction of some level and hacking. Um, which we'll be talking about uh, hacking later specifically. Um, but some researchers are saying, well, these are kind of general problems of the internet. Uh, and with compulsive use, these may not be autism-specific difficulties with using the internet. Yes, we need to be mindful of the risks of using the internet, but maybe not autism-specific. Maybe everyone needs to be mindful of uh, the risks, as uh, Shane Simpson uh, and colleagues were arguing. 
But that kind of sense of compulsive use and the consent of using that the internet is, is dominating our lives and people are always on the phone and that's a negative thing, um, has led to, and you see them all the time, articles around digital detoxing and maybe you should take your phones away from a kid for a week or have a seven day digital detox or try not to use uh, social media between six and eight in the evening or have periods where you're not using. Um, and you see articles like this all the time espousing the benefits uh, of digital detoxing. Um, and clearly that, that's coming again from uh, the, the mainstream environment where largely di digital immigrants such as myself are seeing uh, digital media as a block between me and my child. I would like to talk to my child but they're using a phone so they're not looking at me and interacting with me because they're off uh, using social media and interacting with people who aren't in the room. So from that I get a sense of, well, a digital detox will allow us bonding time uh, in that face-to-face -face context. But then when you think about the autistic context, if a world has been created that allows uh, social interaction and communication that they feel comfortable with, and then people are saying, hey, let's have a detox, let's take that away from you. That's a very different proposition to start suggesting digital detox uh, for the autistic community who suddenly have been given a tool that allows and enables uh, for people who are responding to this, maybe not the entire autistic community, but large swathe of the autistic community who are finding this hugely beneficial tool and then there are people saying, I think you're using it too much. So I think there is something very challenging about this sense of digital detox when we're thinking about um, digital autism and technology and autism. And we really need to think about um, the extent to which we evoke concepts like digital detox from the mainstream world of using technology uh, too much and how uh, challenging that might be for the autistic community. Because this seems to be a sense uh, and an environment where we're talking about inclusion. People, uh, the autistic community, are referring to a sense of inclusion through using this. So uh, they might not be be intervened with or they might not be integrated into face-to-face -face social interaction but they're reporting being very happy feeling included in this digital environment. So in this sense the, the world of social media might be a very inclusive uh, environment uh, if not integrative in the face-to-face -face environment. So that sense of inclusion versus integration uh, it seems very uh, predominant here and social media seems to represent uh, an environment that's inclusive uh, potentially not integrative. So network autism say something uh, very interesting on this topic uh, just to read through this there is a lot of words on the slide. Um, the positive thing about computers is that serendipity has meant that they are potentially the greatest ever asset for autistic people. So digital detox would mean I'm taking away your greatest ever asset for a week for two hours whatever it is. They open up a new world of potential friends, opportunities, and employment. Uh, that's what you wanted to, want to take away. And then the key point is, is perhaps the non-autistic world who has, to, has concrete thinking and needs to accept change in terms of redefining friends and socialising to include social media. So there's a real call there from Network Autism about if the rest of the world changed, then we've got a really inclusive uh, environment. Don't think about this in negative terms. Think about the positive aspects that are occurring uh, and then we can turn this into a very inclusive environment. The internet won't disappear so everyone must work together to make it infinitely positive and beneficial for autistic people. This is uh, it's kind of a whole, let's level the playing field here. Uh, so it's a, it's a great kind of conceptualisation summary from uh, network audience. Okay, so I'd like now to shift from social media to look at a different aspect and uh, one is, is robots that's getting a lot of traction and interest recently. Um, and sometimes what are called socially assistive robots and how robots can be used maybe to assist that social uh, interaction. So it's close, um, so what are socially assistive robots is to create close and effective interaction with a human user for the purpose of giving assistance. So you try and bond with a robot and it will have some kind of assistive role in helping you convalesce or rehabilitate or learn. And then this has been taken on within the autism literature to say there's a possibility to create a new paradigm for the treatment of ASD. And so you can see now we're looking more, uh, we've just been talking about inclusion, but maybe this is looking more at a kind of uh, integrative model. Robots can help the autistic person change so that they can then interact more with the world as it is. So it's more that intervention aspect rather than the inclusion. 
And you can see a wealth of robots that are now emerging um, that have a whole range of different levels of how human they look or whether they're animal-based or actually look like robots always did. Um, and a series of studies looking to see, well, how do autistic people interact with robots? Um, robots can be quite social, um, but they are clearly physical entities. So um, is there a way of bridging the, phys the non-physical strengths associated with autism with the kind of social deficits in these kind of social robots? It tends to be the thinking behind this kind of work. So an example uh, that comes from Kim's study here is, uh, if you can see that, um, you have this adult is always here, and what, they're, what they want to know is how many questions is asked of the adult. So how many utterances does the child evoke and initiate? Uh, and then they have a whole range of different autistic children in here, and you have a facilitator. So they have different conditions. One is they have another adult there as well. Uh, a different condition is they have a little robot in there as well, and the third condition is they have a tablet. And then the kid is given a, a task to do on the table. And you can see um, these stars represent statistical significance to show, ah, when you have a robot, this column is high, and this is the number of utterances down here. The child talks significantly more when the robot is present rather than when the adult is present or when the computer is present. So evidence like this was just, ah, robots seem to elicit some kind of uh, social uh, outpouring from the autistic child. Um, but you can see here as well, this is statistically significant. When you look at the graph, you can see when the robot's there, uh, maybe on average they say about 25 things, and uh, when it's an adult, uh, maybe they say, uh, sorry, 30 things, uh, and when it's an adult, maybe 26 things. So maybe they say four more words between these. This is statistically significant, but you can see the kind of uh, the effect that's going on between an adult and a robot. It is in that direction, and it is statistically significant, but maybe four more words uh, in, a, in an entire session. Uh, what, what does that actually mean in terms of uh, the reality of uh, the in interaction? Uh, similarly, uh, a study that was out earlier this month uh, from the States, Scazzoletti, um, was looking at the first naturalistic study of putting robots in the home and they put this environment here in the home where you have a desk and you have a robot here that's next to the screen. So the setup is you're at home, um, you have uh, your autistic child and the parent is interacting with the autistic child and there's the robot there and they're interacting over the screen here. Uh, and what they're hoping to do um, is try and generate um, a sense of uh, greater social engagement, have this, the robot facilitating interactions between uh, the parent and the child. So uh, in this schematic of it, um, you have the screen here, and then maybe you can get the robot to make eye contact with the child. And I say eye contact, obviously not real eyes, but they're representing robot-like eyes. Um, and the robot can then look at the screen, and the child looks at the screen, and then the robot looks at the adult to see whether or not the child then follows the robot's lead to uh, have a joint attention moment with the adult. So that's the kind of scenario that they're looking to adapt. And it was the first uh, study to put a robot in the home uh, and see what happens. And they looked at how much of these joint attention incidents occurred, and they measured it 30 days before the robot arrived, the day the robot arrived, uh, and the robot was with them for 30 days. Then they took the robot away, and then they measured it 30 days after the robot had gone. So what they showed was, whilst the robot was there, they found an increase in the number of these joint attention, eye contact moments that occurred. However, you can see again that 30 days after the robot had gone, the effect had gone. So whilst the robot was in the home, they did find an effect, but once the robot had gone, so the effect went as well. So again, robots are showing kind of positive signs, um, but there seem to be a great deal of limitations at the moment. And again, it's a way of intervening uh, to say, OK, we think joint attention is a good thing, so let's see if we can change the behaviour of that autistic child to make them engage in behaviours that non-autistic children uh, engage in. A final example, uh, again from Japan, was putting uh, uh, autistic young people in front of uh, one of these three and, and they were asking questions to see how much the autistic person responded. And they were faced with one of three, which was either uh, a human-looking robot, uh, a simplified robot, or an actual human. So there's one of those three, well, you know, and I think um, you know, it comes frequently uh, 
human looking that robot and then they ask the questions can you tell me something embarrassing that's happened to you can you tell me when you were happy kind of just general general questions and see who did the autistic people um, prefer interacting with out of a very human like robot simplified robot or a actual human and found that the simplified robot was um, the, the preferred option a lot more giving of information in, in terms of answering questions in that a simplified human robot rather than an actual human or a human-like uh, robot. To again suggest, that they were suggesting, there's a, a natural tendency to, to interact more through this kind of uh, digital, simplified digital, and if it gets too human-like, uh, then it's not as preferable as when it's uh, simplified uh, as the central one here. Um, so again, we're looking at that question of is this inclusion or intervention when you're looking at robots? Are you trying to adjust that autistic person to make them more non-autistic-like so they can work, work within the non-autistic world? Um, and Damien Milton, who many of you may know is an autistic author who uh, often contributes greatly to these kind of debates, um, was interviewed in Wired where they were looking about, you know, if you just giving robots to autistic children to keep them quiet, is that an ethical thing to do, is the kind of question they're asking, or is there something a little bit more beneficial to the process than that? And Damien Milton asks the question, well, why machines? Are machines the best thing to teach social interaction to people? You think, well, actually, that's a brilliant question. You think, we want to teach social interaction, so who should we, what should we go to? Let's go to robots, let's go to non-social identity. Are they really uh, the best way of teaching social skills. If the point is to intervene and teach social skills, are non-social entities the best things to do that? So he suggests, rather than uh, designing robots to fix uh, autistic people, um, perhaps the research can focus on to helping everyone else better understand the autistic condition and building up empathy between autistic and non-autistic people. And maybe um, these kind of interventions with robots are kind of fundamentally missing the point about what they should be attempting to achieve. And rather than enhancing understanding, then um, a lot of uh, researchers have got this sense of trying to fix the autistic person, whereas in fact what needs fixing is the relationship between the rest of the world and the autistic people. So um, we, we've undertaken some research. Now, I have to give full disclosure here because we were uh, paid to do this because there's a company called Anki who've got this uh, robot, Cosmo, um, and it's, it's commercially available. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say, full disclosure, we were paid to do that. I just wanted to give you a little demonstration because what we wanted to know was, well, do robots, if you don't structure the situation, if you give, just give some robots um, to uh, young people with autism, um, what happens? Does it elicit some kind of social interaction between them? What's the social context that can be generated? So, <coughs> to kind of give you a break from me, I'm going to show you a, a three-minute video uh, of so to a pair of autistic boys uh, using uh, two anchors. Just to kind of show you what we were looking at was not really uh, the robot, but what's happening in the context of uh, using the robots. What's kind of, is there a social interaction that can be elicited within the, the context? So this is the kind of thing, do they talk to each other um, and what's happening beyond what they're doing with the robot? And you can see here uh, Cosmo's kind of got these, these basic expressions and is kind of signalling uh, potential uh, emotional kind of uh, signals through its very uh, basic screen at the front there. Okay, now, uh, the parents have given permission for me to show you this film, but to not to record it. So if you are taking photos or whatever, I can ask that you don't take any photos of the screen, and for the recording as well. Can we also cut out um, the element with the kids in? So as I say, just a three-minute video, uh, so you can see two autistic young men. Okay, so hopefully what we're interested in, it wasn't an experiment, it was just like, let's kind of see what happens. Is there some kind of, and obviously we've kind of just got a highlights there, but hopefully you can see that there is, there is a kind of interaction that's going on. Um, so we've only just done this, so we will be looking to kind of fully analyse it and we're also uh, uh, to see, you know, what, what does kind of just emerge in these kind of naturalistic uh, type settings. And kids helping each other, kids highlighting uh, how one helping another, and all those kind of things just occurring because of uh, the technology that's been set up uh, there. Okay, so um, that's, that's really in contrast with, with having a specific aim of, of trying to make or intervene in any kind of way. It's whether, you know, can technology be used just to 
to make people feel included within uh, an environment such as that. And, and th we're hoping that maybe you know, that could represent a kind of inclusive environment where people feel part of playing together. Um, as opposed to robots that might be used to try to train uh, autistic kids to, to make eye contact. So um, the, the second part, really, of, the, of the, the talk is really to focus on that sense of uh, participation from the end user com community. Because to focus upon inclusion as opposed to intervention um, may well be coming up from the uh, autistic community themselves. And, and you're really only going to know that if the autistic community are involved within the design and the development of these technologies. What do the autistic community want uh, technology for? Is it for intervention or is it for inclusion? And how best can the, the views of the autistic community be integrated into that process? And Sue Fletcher Watson has just written how research generally uh, needs to do this a great deal more uh, based around uh, autism. But I'm going to focus more specifically on uh, what's sometimes called participatory design and the development of technologies uh, and incorporating the autistic community within the development of technologies for the autistic community. So one way of uh, addressing this a sense of inclusion rather than uh, intervention is to work with the autistic communities to develop uh, technology that the autistic community wants. <coughs> so participatory design is often abbreviated to PD, uh, and PD involves um, people who will use the technology uh, in the process of designing, developing, and evaluating it. So it's that kind of integration, yes, we're developing it for you, so what do you want? So it's been argued that PD has the potential to enable digital empowerment and social inclusion of those involved and can be an effective form for developing interdisciplinary research and engaging with wider communities, such as the audit community. So the crucial variable there is uh, embedded within participatory design is that sense of social inclusion. So by including people uh, within the design process, we're also including in the broader sense uh, the inclusion of the autistic community with the development of the technologies because the d technologies are being developed uh, in line with uh, what the autistic community would require. So we had a whole seminar series of this and if you're uh, interested in this topic, um, Digital Bubbles was the name of the seminar series and there's loads and loads of uh, information there if you're interested in that sense of, of design. I'm just going to give uh, a few examples here. So one of the things that came out of that was uh, to develop an app called uh, Ask Me It and that was simply to say to be able to uh, interact with research and say, if you want something researched and you're a member of the autistic community, upload your idea here. Uh, and it was up to you whether you wanted to leave your uh, contact details, but if you did, then that could then be uh, co-developed with uh, the autistic uh, members of the community. And part of the digital bubbles had a lot of autistic people there, and this emerged from those discussions with the autistic community saying, a mode of communication just to flag up some ideas, saying, what about doing this? Um, so that developed the Ask Me it app, which is just a method of interacting and saying, have you thought about doing this? This is what would improve my life. Uh, and a whole series of universities uh, co coordinated on that. Uh, and then the ideas, obviously not all the ideas can take, get taken forward, but then it's co-created what can take and discuss what can and can't uh, get taken forward. So I just wanted to flag that up as one mechanism by which uh, communications can be enhanced. I was involved um, in a, a project called Ideas, um, which was developing protocols um, to uh, enable and empower the autistic community to work within a design for uh, a maths tutor. Uh, now, this, um, I'm a psychologist, uh, and this was very much an interdisciplinary project, um, and Laura Benton was a PhD student, supervised by Hilary Johnson, who were from the computer science side, the human-computer interaction. I'm, I won't stray into their turf, I'm more on the psychology side of things. Um, but they're setting up protocols with how do you get then, what's the best way to engage, and these were teenagers largely, or secondary school age children, um, into the development of the maths tutor uh, for uh, autistic people. And we have a process of, first of all, um, if you can see that, uh, it's a setting up the rules of what's going on. You think of a team, you identify who everyone is, and you work out rules, like I won't tell you to shut up and I will listen to other people. So you set up the rules beforehand so that if someone says, uh, breaks the rules, you can then always refer back. And you set up a very explicit time scale um, of what's going to happen when and what the uh, objectives are. So it's making the whole session very transparent and explicit. Uh, and then engaging in a series of, of low-level prototypes. So using plasticine to uh, start thinking, okay, what would you like this math tutor to look like? And here they started building a car as a part of a, 
uh, a journey. They were going on a journey, a maths learning journey. Um, and then, uh, this is cardboard, it's kind of a, a low-tech mock-up, and Laura made this a kind of brilliant rendition of a, a computer. But then it's transferring it from the, the plasticine models and kind of drawing it how it might look on the screen, and then uh, you can stick it on the screen. And here you are, you've kind of got the maths coming here, and you're kind of driving past the maths. And this evolved with the autistic kids coming up um, with maths islands, and each island was a different topic in mathematics. And you drove around in your car from island to island, and as you did it, the flags appeared. So all these design ideas were coming from the autistic community and the autistic children. And we took them back, and the programmers implemented it, and we went back and said, is this what you meant? And they said, yeah, that's good, and no, I don't like that. So it was that kind of iterative process that resulted in a maths tutor uh, that had been designed by autistic children for autistic children. Uh, and so we went on to show uh, that, yes, it did help maths learning, but actually everyone liked it. So even if you weren't autistic, you were none autistic. Oh, that's great. We like going around the islands with our little car. Um, so like much that's designed or, or adapted for autistic people, there are general benefits for uh, the, the learning community as a whole. Another project that I'm involved with at the moment is uh, looking at social stories, and some of you might be familiar with the social stories uh, uh, intervention that is um, very popular in schools and with parents and actually with autistic people because it's basically reading a story, so it's not seen as very uh, uh, intimidating in terms of being an intervention. Uh, and typically, uh, this is written by hand, and there's a kind of traditional paper-based way of doing it, uh, and we've engaged in uh, taking the idea from ideas uh, and using those protocols to work with parents and teachers uh, as well as the uh, autistic children say, well, if this was given a digital format, how would you like it to look? How would you like the pages to turn? How would you like to insert photos? Um, so linking up all of those different aspects um, from the adult community as well as the child uh, community. So that's just as an example there of a social story where you, you kind of might describe the situation that's going on, uh, I want to play, and then it kind of gives you uh, an idea of how you might approach that situation to solve. You want to play, but you don't know how to enter the game and that kind of thing. So you just you give the social story, um, and the idea behind them is it engenders a sense of understanding in children. So whilst... Uh, they're widely used, and some suggest that 90% of schools are using them. Half the time they're highly effective, but half the time they're not effective at all. So why might that be? And the, the argument is, well, it's, it's often the variability, because you might be a very busy teacher. But if you, had, you were able to deliver this through an iPad, that would address that. So um, one of the things we looked at was the research, and what were the research studies looking at, and what did parents and what were they using social stories for? And the largest thing that um, parents and practitioners were using social stories for was, was to help with transitions, but that wasn't where the research was. So already there was a disconnect between people who were researching social stories and people who were actually using social stories in the real world. So we developed the app that looks a little bit like this, um, and we were developing it with... Uh, here we have 12 children, and we were looking at those who also have intellectual disability to see can we involve those, and we could. And they gave us lots of feedback. So some were autistic, some were autistic with learning disabilities, some just have intellectual disability. And they told us things like, if it says good work, we always want our name in there. We want it to be personalised. And this is the kind of thing we might want um, a big tick if we're doing well. So they just told us how to make it, really. And then as we get more right, I want my reward to get bigger and bigger. I want a little monster, then a medium-sized monster, then I want a really big monster going, grrr, if I get all my answers right. So they told us how they wanted to change it. Um, and if you're having repeated social stories, they were able to say what they wanted, the rewards for successfully reading the social stories. So they were able um, to do all this very effectively. So sorry these are a bit messy, but all I wanted to show was this is really just showing this is an increase in the desired behaviour. So what, for whatever, uh, this study had 20 autistic children, and overall there was an increase in the desired behaviour that the social story was trying to address. And this second show slide here breaks down the 20 different results to show you that it is a bit messy. Overall, uh, it's hugely successful, but for some you can see there was no improvement, and, on, uh, and sometimes the improvement's a bit random. So it's, it's rather than just show, oh yeah, it works perfectly, there is variability in how effectively 
it works. Similarly, uh, a different study, um, the children in the school were going on camp and they had different worries about the going on camp without their parents. So um, they were addressed through the social stories and then asked, um, did you, do you think it improved their level of understanding? And again, you can see for one kid it didn't, but for many it did. Did it reduce child's, the child's anxiety? And mostly anxiety went down before and after using the intervention. Um, and overarchingly, they did head towards their goals. So again, there was variability uh, between, but overarchingly, it was a success that children did uh, seem to understand about the social story's goal, get towards that goal, and reduce their anxiety. So I'm telling you this well because coming in 2019, um, we will be fully converted into an app and it will be freely available uh, in the new year. So I can let you know more about that Social Stories app. So we're just in that final process now of making it uh, freely downloadable on uh, the iPlay and stuff. Um, just a couple more very briefly. I was involved in an Erasmus-funded project called Smart ASD. And what this, again, it's, got a, it's all free uh, if you go there. And there's a profile where you can identify what can my child do on an iPad, for example. Can it swipe? Can it turn it on and off? If the child can't turn the iPad on and off, then that really restricts what kind of apps might be uh, desirable for that child. So first of all, you get a, a profile of what kind of apps, uh, or what the child's capabilities are in using the technology, and then based upon that and your needs, it then makes recommendations for what apps you might want. So it's a suggestion, uh, a way of suggesting this might be, if you have that need and your child has this capability, then this app might be appropriate. As I say, the website's there, uh, and it's all freely downloadable. Um, we, and associated with that is uh, an online MOOC, where you have a course that explains the whole process for you as well, and again, free to attend. That's Princess Sophie opening our MOOC. Um, we also have a project funded by FIRA, thank you very much, FIRA, called Better uh, Evidence to, uh, for Technology in Autism. And this is asking the question, uh, what does make, what evidence do people from the autistic community want for technology? What do they want to know about? What does that evidence want to look like? And we're something called a Delphi study. We're involving the autistic community, researchers, developers, everyone who's involved in that, designers, the processors say, what do you think evidence for digital technologies for autism might look like? And that goes round and round with people commenting on each other's comments until you get an agreed <coughs> consensus about what e evidence for technology should look like. So that process is going on and it'll be finishing uh, again early in 2019 and hopefully we'll have a seminar. I don't know if the NAS will let me have your webinars, but I could let you know and you'll all be very welcome to come back here uh, early in the new year and have a seminar and we could disseminate uh, the findings to you. Okay, so in conclusion then, in terms of digital aut uh, autism, I think we really need to think about um, whether the purpose of the technologies that we are using with all the autistic community are for inclusion or for uh, intervention. And that, uh, hopefully I've argued that the sense of participatory design and the involvement um, can really enhance that sense of inclusion within that. So my final plug uh, is uh, that we have another MOOC that's looking at good practice in autism education. So if you are involved with uh, Compulsory education, kind of 5 to 15. Uh, there's a free online course that will be starting next Monday. Uh, it's run through Future Learns, all few, free, again, funded by Erasmus, and um, that takes you through good practice in autism education and what inclusion means. So uh, if you haven't had enough of me already, you can get more of me um, <laughs> and colleagues from across Europe on what inclusion means. Okay, so thank you to these people, all of whom have been central, and uh, thank you very much for listening.